Good day. Uh, so good to be here with you. Um, I hope uh, over the last couple of weeks you've been able to join us in this preparation for Easter coming just around the corner. Um, we've been doing a, a sermon series called Embracing Eternity. And I've been sharing the pulpit with my uh, co-laborer in Christ, Pastor David. And this week is my turn. And next week will be his turn on Palm Sunday. So thank you for inviting me into your places and your spaces. Uh, I so uh, do not take that for granted. And I appreciate that you do this. I pray that you will be blessed and that you will bless others uh, with the message God has for us today from John's Gospel. David Mathis writes this, What will we do with the times we have, messy, confusing, and frustrating as they are? Mathis, in his article examining the challenges of our day, some of them anyways, and among the global and national challenges, Mathis includes what he calls the current information crisis. So one might ask, pray tell, what may that be, David? Well, Mathis comes to a fair and I believe a logical presupposition of the unreliability of many of the online sources in recent years. Essentially, folks, in our hyperspeed instant communication age, with the constant flow of information into our homes, through our devices, wherever we are actually, the temptation, Mathis would suggest, is to be more aware of global and national events than our own places and spaces in our backyard. And to quote Mathis, from day to day, we can too easily miss the real life opportunities to do others good in the name of Christ. We can shut our doors and our ears to our neighbors in favor of hearing endless cycles of other people's news. How true that is. This article reminded me that as a Christian, I am not immune to the events in the world around me. Yet it is very interesting as I thought about the way I've responded to important issues such as those that Matthew brings up in his article. And as an intimate personal student of my own selfish uh, sinful nature, there's always the temptation before me, as it will be before you, to respond to current events in extremes, one polar end to the other. Either immerse myself fully or at the opposite, and ignore it all. And over the years, I've become very aware of my human tendencies, which more often are not beneficial nor productive to me or anyone else for that matter. And the saddest and worst of all my reactions at times do not match what I profess to believe about God and the world around me, what I profess to believe what the Holy Spirit reveals in the Word of God about our times and current events. What is one to do then? What is one to do? Well, one, I, I guess, could simply respond by saying, so much to learn and so little time to learn and leave it at that. Or friends, one could respond like Mordecai. Mordecai, you familiar with Mordecai? He's in the Old Testament, the Old Testament book of Esther. When Haman schemed to have all the Jews slaughtered in the kingdom at the time, Mordecai went to see his niece, Queen Esther, to intervene and speak to the king. Sounds easy, right? After all, she was his queen, not to mention she was Jew Jewish and had some vested interest in that. But it was not so easy. Read the story for yourself. It was downright dangerous. The potential to be killed for Queen Esther on the scale of 1 to 10 was 9.9. .9. The king knew this. Haman knew this. Queen Esther knew this. Mordecai knew this. Yet Mordecai said to his beloved niece, Who knows? But, the, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Please turn in your Bibles to John's Gospel. Uh, today we'll be in chapter 12, and we'll be reading from verse 20 through to 36 for the context. Verse 20, chapter 12. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me for this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Verse 29. The crowd that was there and was there, that was there and heard it said, had, it, had said it had thundered, pardon me. Otherwise said an angel, others said an angel had spoken to him. Verse 30, Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your word, and uh, as we spend some time going through these verses, uh, trying to understand what's happening here, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to illuminate our hearts and our minds, plant those seeds and grow that fruit in our hearts and our lives. And may we take these things uh, that we learn today and understand about you today and bring it into our places and spaces. And may we be uh, uh, the bearer of the good news of Christ for your glory, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's set the context. Jesus and the disciples arrived back in Judea upon learning, if you remember back in chapter 11, that his dear friend Lazarus had been sick. But prior to going to Bethany, a village near Jerusalem, the Gospels remind us that Jesus and the disciples had traveled from Galilee and south, and then somewhere along the way they did a side trip into the western part of Berea. You don't have to worry about where those places are, but it wasn't in Judea. The gospel writers also remind us that Jesus, by this time in his ministry, as far as the religious leaders in Jerusalem were concerned, was as good as dead. They had made their plans and were waiting for the best opportunity to arrest him. Therefore, our narrative, friends, here in John's gospel, here in chapter 12, is a pivotal moment Jesus' public ministry would end, and then he would isolate himself along with the disciples until his arrest. Keep in mind also that the events from the resurrection of Lazarus to the death and resurrection of Jesus, as we know from the Bible, was no surprise for Jesus. For even he said here, as we read, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Matter of fact, everything we can say, everything that was, was, trans, was to transpire after Jesus arrived in Jerusalem was all according to the sovereign plan and will of the triune God. Keep that in mind as well. This wasn't some coincidental, accidental thing. We also need to keep in mind that half of John's gospel is spent highlighting the events that led Jesus to Jerusalem and the week leading up to his death and resurrection. So with this in mind, our narrative picks up after Jesus' triumphal entry. Remember, this was the Passover. There were many people in Jerusalem, tens of thousands, and they would have surrounded Jesus and the disciples as Jesus made his way from Bethany to the temple in Jerusalem. And they shouted out, the text tells us here in John chapter 12, verse 13, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This, of course, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Our text finds Jesus in the temple court of the Gentiles. 
teaching and speaking to the crowds. Verse 20 tells us that some Greeks in Jerusalem were there to worship as well, and they wanted to see Jesus. Now this thing about Greeks here probably just meant uh, Gentiles. Anyways, they approached Philip with their request, and Philip went to tell Andrew, and together with the Greeks, Philip and Andrew told Jesus. With the crowds, the Greeks, the Pharisees, were no doubt there looking on. Jesus said, hi, nice to meet you, Greeks. Of course he didn't say that. I'm not jesting. Jesus said, the hour has come from the Son of Man to be glorified. And that's a very interesting thing to say when, he was being, when people were being introduced to him. So we fast forward then, folks, a few days, and we find Jesus and the disciples sharing the Passover feast together. Unlike the other gospel writers, John here provides the details of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Now, time doesn't permit further commentary, but one thing we can take away from here is that Jesus would have washed all the disciples' feet, including Judas Iscariot. And this is important for our time today. Because moments later, when they were eating the meal together, Jesus shared a piece of bread uh, with Judas Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, the text tells us Satan entered him. You find that in the 13th chapter, verse 27. Then Jesus said to Judas, what you're about to do, do quickly. So Judas left. And it's interesting to note that John includes what I believe is a very important detail after Judas departed. And it was night. So keep that one in mind. So when Judas had left, John records these words from Jesus. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. There he is saying that again. So let's talk for a second. And I want to ask you, you remember the question asked of us by David Mathis at the intro. What will we do with the times we have? Messy, confusing, and frustrating as they are. Let me just adjust that question and ask you this. What will you do with the time you have? What will you do with the time you have? If you're like me, you do have choices in how you respond. Even if you don't think you do in your life now, you always have choices. When Jesus said to the crowd in the temple, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, what do you think he meant by the hour has come? When Jesus said to Jesus, while he was still chewing away on the bread Jesus gave him, what you're about to do, do quickly, what do you think he meant? Well, friends, the page had turned. The page had turned. The hour had come. What was awaiting Jesus in a few hours was the cross, his death, his resurrection, and his eventual glorification. And Jesus said about the hour to come, keeping in mind that he was fully human and fully God. Fully human and fully God. Now my soul is troubled. What did he mean? We know that Jesus would say that again when praying in the garden moments before his rest. He said in Matthew chapter 26, 38, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. What did he mean? What does this phrase, my soul is troubled, here in John's gospel, and my soul is overwhelmed, basically the same thing in Matthew's gospel. What did it mean? Well, friends, it's a strong term which signifies horror and anxiety and agitation. Through all the external events surrounding the days and the continual confusion with his beloved disciples, Jesus never once wavered from the cross. This was his appointed hour in the story grand scheme and story of redemption from eternity past. But dear friends, dear friends, he felt every single blow, every lash of the whip, the nails in his hands and in his feet, and the shame and the rejection and the pain of the brutal cross. He knew what was in store on the cross as the wrath of God for the sins of the world, your sin, my sin, horrified the sinless Lamb of God. Why then did God the Son do this? Have you ever asked yourself that? Why did he go through this? Friends, he did that for you and for me and for every person in this world. 
because God loves every person. Let me ask again, what will you do with the time you have? Let me be more specific. Has what math has called the information crisis and the constant flow of information into your home or on your devices captivated your mind and heart these days? Consumed your time? Consumed your mental, physical, and spiritual energy? How is that working for you? High blood pressure? Anxiety? Keeping you awake at night? And maybe fear has found a resting place in your heart. You see, Jesus was overwhelmed. He was troubled. What did he do? He obeyed and trusted his Father. He even said, No, it was for this very reason I came at, I came at this hour. What was Jesus' prayer in the garden? Well, perspiring blood. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, friends, understood his appointed hour and even said this, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Here, using the metaphor to describe his death and what it will produce. You see, a better translation of the phrase many seeds would be, it bears much fruit, as we find in NSAB, or plentiful harvest of new lives in the NLT, because Jesus knew that his death and resurrection would produce a harvest of new lives, of new life. It would bear much fruit for his own glory and for the glory of his Father. That is our, his way, was the only way to glorify his Father and the only way you and I can glorify the Father. Yes, Jesus was troubled and overwhelmed, yet he obeyed and trusted his Father, and his Father acknowledged him when Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. What did God the Father say to him? I have glorified it, and I will glorify, and I will glorify it again. One might say, or you might say, Pastor, you don't know the trouble I have endured these days. You don't know how overwhelmed I am today. I would agree with you. I don't know the depth or the contours of your trouble, but I know someone that does, and so do you. See, every single tear you shed over your anguish, your sorrow, your fear, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. The pain of every broken relationship that you've experienced in life, Jesus knows how you feel. The Bible calls Jesus a man of sorrows, familiar with pain. That's the prophet Isaiah speaking hundreds of years before Jesus showed up in Isaiah 53.3. Every painful rejection, every curse thrown your way, Jesus knows how you feel. Jesus is described by the same prophet Isaiah as one who was despised and rejected by mankind. You've been rejected by people. You've been rejected by people here and there. Jesus was rejected by mankind. You have felt the sting of others looking down on you, laughing behind your back, ignoring you, and with a smirk and a shake of the head dismissing you like you were some unwanted piece of rotten fruit. Jesus knows how you feel. And deep down where no one is welcome to see or know, where no one knows, no one knows except you and God, you feel the weight of your sin. You know that feeling and weight of shame for your words have destroyed friendships and alienated family. You feel trapped and anger, the only avenue to vent your shame and frustration. The sin in your life slowly but surely silencing your conscience calling out to you to stop, stop, please stop before it's too late. And Jesus, who was despised and rejected, the Bible tells us that he took up our pain 
and bore our sufferings, even though we thought him punished by God. Even when we had all gone astray, turned to our own ways, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Are you weighed down by trouble and sin? Turn to Jesus, for today is the day of salvation. Well, folks, we still have a challenge before us. Two questions remain for us to address, and then we'll be done. First one, what is my response to the current times? Second one, what will I do with the time given me? And before we try to tackle this, we need to know a few things. Not a lot, just a few. This will require us to think biblically. What an essential, needed thing, thing, thing to do in our, in our lives today. As hard as we might be, we need to shut off the news. We need to silence our devices and think biblically. Because the answer to our questions are right here in the text. We need to know first that Satan, the world and the sinful flesh, has been defeated. Jesus himself speaks of this. Here in our text, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. How was this accomplished? Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. What does the term lifted up mean? The crucifixion of Jesus has broken the chains of sin and the sting of death. So now we can tackle the first question. What is my response to current events? The answer is verse 25. Read it with me. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Folks, this is not about a self-destructive nature. This is not about putting up a false, brave front facing the issues of the day. Yes, of course, it's important to recognize our times. My, in fact, God wants us to recognize our times. And what does it mean? Friends, this is a calling to live in the light of eternity. And our calling as disciples is Jesus Christ in our time, in our places and spaces. Just as the brothers and sisters have done over the centuries in their time and place. Mark's Gospel records these words of Jesus. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. How do we respond to current events? How do believers respond to current events? The same as Jesus did. We trust and obey God even if it may cost our very lives on this earth. One commentator put it this way. At the heart of a disciple of Jesus is love. And at the heart of love is sacrifice. Last question. What will I do with the time given me? Answer, friends, is verse 26. Let's read it together. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Remember Queen Esther? It didn't look good for her. Her chances were slim, yet she believed her uncle that she was the queen for such a time as this. And the Jews were saved from certain death. The Apostle Paul said that God, from one man, made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him though he's not far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Paul also said to the same crowd, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he appointed. That's Jesus, folks. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That's Jesus, folks. What will I do with the time given me? Immerse myself in the culture? Watch news 24-7 a day? Run and hide out in fear? Remember Judas. Remember, I said to remember what John said, that he went out into the night. Friends, Judas was lost in the darkness 
of sin and death. Better question to ask yourself, as a child of light, what will I do with the time given me? I can't answer that for you. Just remember this while you consider the question as we close. There is a day set that God will judge the world with justice by the man appointed. It's just around the corner, folks. Jesus is coming. It's just around the corner. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your message. We thank you, O Holy Spirit, as you inspire us to understand, as you inspire us to move, as you inspire us to put this to our hands and our feet. O Lord, we want to glorify you with our lives. We have a message of hope in a world that is hopeless in many ways. And one day, just around the corner, you will come, sweet Jesus, and it will all be made right. And all these struggles and all these things that we endure now will be but a distant memory, if we remember them at all. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for having me. God bless you. God keep you. Make his face shine upon you. And may you be a blessing to others. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you. Amen. Shalom.